Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic podcast. Today I'm very excited to host and have as a guest doctor someone that I only met a few minutes ago, but I'm so happy that he accepted my invitation to be part of this podcast because I decided to write him an email after I watched his video titled Stop Transcribing. So <laughs> I thought, wow, this is this is going to be interesting. And I, I watched his video and uh, of course I do agree to some extent on some of the things that he's saying, but I also disagree on some other extents. And for the first time, I have the privilege to interview someone that uh, says or is advocating to stop transcribing because he's uh, doing nothing good, but he will be able to explain. So please welcome the guest doctor for today's episode is Mr. Denny Markovic. Welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm the doctor, but I actually didn't, don't even, I'm like the only person in the United States that don't have a degree. Oh, um, okay. I, fin I did fin finish high school though, so. Yeah, but now you you, you are a doctor today in, in this clinic. Yeah, in this... I, thought, I actually taught in a, in a lot of colleges, yeah. Um, yeah. clinics and master classes. So. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when, what do you want to start? Uh, I, I usually, I have a set of questions and I was thinking yesterday, how am I going to do that? Because my set of questions are all designed for people who transcribe a lot and who is telling to other people to transcribe a lot. So you, you are the first one and I, I'm not really sure how to deal with it. Um, but... Uh, we can start. Usually, my first question is, why do you transcribe? So, I would ask you, why did you want to do a video like that and say, guys, stop transcribing because you are not going anywhere? Um, I just think it's overrated. I think that it took over uh, the world of jazz pedag pedagogy. Um, and I think it's, it's just, I think it just became something that people do without thinking. Um, and everybody accepts that it makes them so much better, even though I think the evidence is not well. I think some of the better things that transcription, transcribing used to give you, um, it no longer apply now that you, that everybody uses amazing slowdowner. I think that when you listen to a phrase and when you try to figure it out, you actually learn a lot of things on the way. But if you go note by note, I think it's just there is nothing musical about it. You're actually not receiving, you're not getting anything um, from, the, from the material. And I have an issue, generally speaking, with a lot of people the way we practice, and it's not just with transcribing, uh, that the time actually playing, actually practicing, is very limited and a lot of the time is wasted on putting the saxophone down listening to other people pressing on the computer listen looking to the phone looking through videos to decide what to do and and not actually practicing and then somebody has two hours and out of his two hours he ends up practicing 40 minutes and and it's just it doesn't seem to me like a good use of somebody's time and then the other thing that I have issues with transcribing is that it puts a lot of emphasis, I said in the video, on the notes. And the notes are the least important thing that, um, that people play. So I'm actually not against transcribing at all because I still transcribe. I just, I transcribe things that stands out to me. And I specifically try to transcribe stuff on saxophone. 
uh, which really is what I play. All right. So if I give you, if I give you an example of stuff I play, right? Um, did you listen a little bit to the to the links I sent you? I did, I did, and I have some questions there for you. But go on, please. But, okay, so I have. Okay, like how I play or don't like how I play. I think that it's pretty. It's pretty fair to say that I found a lot of things on saxophone, a lot, you know, compared to other musicians, a lot of things on saxophone that haven't really been done before. And I found a lot of new stuff. Uh, and I found it also in a way that, not in a way that avant-garde players find it, I found it in a way that makes uh, sense in a musical context and I can make it work in a lot of styles. Um, it, I, I find things that are pretty, pretty flexible. And, and, and if you, people that are more into our discography can hear a lot of the things that I find, they, they see how I develop them over time. Um, I, don't, I don't just find something and let it go. So to me, if somebody learns some of the stuff that I found, it makes perfect sense to transcribe it because it's a movement, it's a unique movement for saxophone, like physical movement for saxophone that makes sense in a, in a musical sense, but it's also flexible enough that you can use it in different ways. And if you're creative, you can take that and, and, and you use it in different ways. So I'll give an example of everybody knows. Everybody knows the cannonball drill, right? right? It's, it's sick. I love it. And I use it too. But again, I take it and I try to use it in different musical contexts, in a different musical context and different rhythms. And it goes up all the time. I try to go down. I try to do it with, uh, you know, just whatever, like up and down or false fingering or just, you know, just in different ways that would make sense into my playing, you know, but it's something that you can take. But just to take a line from somebody, it's just very usually... It's not that there is not much well, because somebody that plays well, everything sounds good, but it just it doesn't really translate into somebody's playing that already has a style of playing. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think that's what people need to work on is is their style, and and that's also something. Sorry that I'm going on and on, but the last thing I'm going to say about it before I let you, you know, talk. But to me, the working on your style is basically good about music and what's good about saxophone playing right and and not everybody wants to have their own style I understand some people just want to play which is fine but I'm, I can only talk about what you know what my goal was which to find my own voice in saxophone and I always ask myself what does it mean to have to play a good solo what does it mean to play good lines what what does it mean to get better because technically I can already I play in every subdivision anybody ever played I you know I, I, not like I can play what everybody plays. It's not like I can play every line Brecker played, obviously, but he can't, he wouldn't be able to play my lines either. So it's like there's some point where you, you, you know, you just ask yourself, what does it mean to get better? And the more you do it, the more you get your own personal style. Um, and every person is different. So if you keep asking yourself this question, it's kind of like therapy, uh, like with every person is different. So if you keep asking yourself this question, you would find, unique things and you get unique stuff about your playing yeah i think All right so a lot of a lot of uh of it of to me of practicing is kind of like inside out and obviously you have to listen to a ton of jazz and i i'll still listen to a lot of jazz and i always look i always look for stuff to steal i i also steal without any shame like i always listen to saxophone players any saxophone players that become half known i look at all the stuff look for stuff that i can take um and make my own Without, and I still have any shame. I don't do, again, because I don't do licks. I don't take somebody's lick and change two notes and be like, now it's my lick. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyway. so uh, listening to you talking about this, I can see that um, that title of your video is, of course, uh, is provocative. And I'm glad that you put it there. But what are you telling me is that you are not against transcribing, you are against some uh, approach to transcribing that you can see in these days. A lot of people think that if I transcribe, you know, one solo a week, I become better. But this is, and people who follow my podcast know that I've been talking a lot about this. I also had a couple of videos where I 
give out strategies on what, how to get the most out of a transcription. And I always tell, uh, this is, goes with a comment I left on your video, but to me, the act of transcribing is a preparation for your study, is not the goal. So when I finish getting all the notes or if I finish memorizing the whole solo, that is when I start practicing the solo. Is The transcription itself is just a vehicle. But just transcribing itself is already a very healthy practice because you are exposed to the language, you can go deep in details, and your ears are improving a lot. I mean, I can tell you that my first solos were terribly done because my ears weren't as good as they are now, probably. And now, especially if I transcribe a saxophone now, I don't need the saxophone anymore. And uh, while before I checked every single note and then I ended up with 50% of the material wrong, Right, uh, so it's a level of, of refinement and then you start recognizing also things that are difficult to write down, like you start recognizing rhythms, a, a particular uh, technique on the saxophone, like whether it's a false fingering or a particular way of tonguing, of playing a ghost note. And those are the things that I think we can learn. I'm, and all my students know this, I'm the, the president of the Association Against Leaks and Patterns in Jazz, because I think that that's stupid. You know, if you have a conversation with someone, you don't want to repeat something that you have learned of a book. I can take a book, learn a phrase, and then I go and the guy asks me, how are you? And I reply, you know, John went to the shop and didn't buy it. And it's totally unrelated. This is to me what happens when you play licks and patterns. However, uh, on my personal side, I can tell you that I have transcribed solos in the past and I've been able to process some of those languages, some of those phrases, uh, which... I don't want to call it lick because usually I like to have a very long phrase rather than a simple, you know, eight note or four notes phrases. And then years ago, when I bumped into the original uh, solo again, I can hear what generated the process of me playing a sort of similar phrase today. But the fact is that when I play that phrase, I'm not thinking now I'm playing a Joe Henderson line. I just feel I'm playing my own stuff. And this is what I'm interested in. So I transcribe to understand the language and to get some ideas and process them into who I am. Basically, I started with classical music. I studied classical music for 15 years before I moved into jazz. And, you know, sometimes I get comments that I sound different. And I'm happy to receive those comments because this is who I am, you know. And, uh, of course, what you the example you provide of, you know, people playing leak after leak after leak, that's wrong. That's wrong, but I try not to go that far and saying, don't transcribe. I say transcribe, but with the right approach, because you can get, you can still learn a lot. Um, let, me, let me just inter interject with something. So I guess with two things. Um, so to me, it's like a thousand minutes to get too in, deep into it, but to me, music theory, right and it it, it it does call it directly to it to what we're talking about music theory is not i'm gonna make a video about it i i just didn't get a chance yet but music theory is not it's not a scientific theory and it's it's just because scientific theory it's like whatever you, it's like you predict basically you can predict the future right? it's like something you can disprove and you can say 
Uh, did you see the video? Sorry, I'm, my brain goes all over the place. Did you see the video that just came out of this uh, saxophone player? I don't remember his name from the Lincoln Center, and he's playing the sharp 11 on a SAS 4 chord. No. And it became viral, like how this guy's a genius, and it's like the worst <laughs> note you can play, and it just sticks on it. Uh, Did you see this video? No, I haven't. No, okay. Uh, it's one of his videos, the last like saxophone like viral thing, but and everybody's making the stank for like this is the greatest thing. And I was like, Ugh. anyway, so it's like to me, obviously, it doesn't work, and I don't think it would have ever worked if we didn't have all everybody around this person going like oh. deep, right? It sounds awful, um, but I'm saying it's not scientific in that sense that you can disprove something because I say it sounds good, you say it doesn't sound good, or uh, vice versa. Um, so what is it? It's a language, right? We there's this vast world of sound, and we give it, we give it names by function. But uh, just like languages, you have different uh, music theories, and it doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. The example I like to give is you have a library with an infinite amount of books, and that sounds. And you can arrange the books by weight, by name of author, by uh, country of origin of also by length of book, by the amount of time you have vowels in the books. There are infinite amount of ways to organize a library. But if you organized it, let's say, by country of origin of the author, and you want every book that was written in October 1995, you're not going to be able to find it, right? So you want to have the right tool, um, the right tool. So that's one thing I want to say. I want to put out, but I'll, I'll, hopefully I can connect everything together. So that's one thing. And I think with people, they just... First of all, when you, turn, when you think about somebody, it's really important to understand how we thought, like how they arrange the... You know, if you were talking about transcribing, and that's why it's actually good if you can... Trans, if you were already looking like that at stuff like that, it's good if you can transcribe somebody playing like blues a few blues or so, like just you can see, figure out how they thought about something. So that's actually the good thing about transcribing. And I do, I told you before we started, but I do like looking at transcriptions. Um, and I do do that to try and maybe figure out how people thought about things, like how they arranged their library. And that's something also important to people to understand because they're like, oh, you say that I'll, I have my harmony system that I use that I really like. And I like it because it gives me basically um how to play inside the harmony in every harmonic context which is in my band it's pretty complicated because it's a lot of styles and then obviously what i told i sent you the gypsy jazz album that yeah. we played so you can see how my stuff translates immediately into something that's completely unrelated to what i usually play but i didn't have to change any, the way i think at all yeah to play that music right um no no I, so, but I, it's not like oh but Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, to what you just said, I mean, music theory is something that men have created, you know, is, is not in nature. The only thing that exists in nature is the series of harmonics or overtones, you know, which is a, you can calculate the frequencies and that's it. And and in fact, the, the harmonic series is a series of, out of tune for us, you know, as, as soon as you go up with the series, you, you get more and more out of tune. So again, the main intervention is clear there. So I do agree. We can say that music theory is a science because it's just someone that decided that C to G is a perfect fifth and call it perfect fifth. And then, yes, there is a reason why some intervals are called perfect and some others are called imperfect, but it's, it's a superimposition. It's a mechanism created by human beings. So I, I don't think, even though I call it clinic, this podcast, but I don't think we are relating to any science here. And you can leave... A, a, I think it's important... Yeah, it's important to people to understand because when they hear somebody, yeah. and when I talk about music, when I talk about it on, now on the YouTube channel, but when I talk about clinic, I, 
people have to understand that I explain how I divide the world of music. Yeah. How I see it. It's not that somebody said something else and one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It's just we both divide it in a different way. And it's to function in the specific yeah. way that we need it to function. And what I was once say, and that has to do also with why I think people, you know, rely too much on transcriptions is that sometimes some something takes you to a point, but you need to change your paradigm if you want to go beyond the point. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you don't need the, mo- the best tool all the time. If you're going to wait for the best tool to start working, you will never start working. You should use the best tool that's available to you. Yeah. But also, once you found that best tool that's available to you, it doesn't mean that that's the tool you should use always. It, you need to be open. You know, I, I'll give an example with my playing, right? Uh, could I change my ambajur? My ambajur a lot of time change my tonguing, but the tonguing is the best example. I tongue a ton when I'm playing. You can physically see it when you look at the, at the notes and uh, on portals. And the reason is because I play, when I play fusion, and now it's, you know, it's like, I play with electric bass, with electric guitar. Everybody subdivides a lot. And if I tongue, it just makes it sound like a guitarist picks. So it makes it sound really in time, like in a very tight way. Um, and if you don't tongue, even if you're really in time, it just, it, it sounds a little bit more like um, mushy, right? So I really like the pristine, precise sound. So I tongue a lot. And, you know, I had my way of tonguing, and then I saw this guy called Rudy Widoft, Widoft, you know that guy? Mm-hmm. And he, it was crazy to me, like single tonguing, and I never heard him by tonguing like that. And, you know, I read his book, and I was like, dude, it's changed, completely changed the way I was tonguing, you know? And I could easily be like, no, it's, you know, just ignore it. But the lie is like, no, I'm going to work on it. Somebody is doing something that I can't do. I want to be able to do it. Yeah. Like his way is obviously better because I can't play the way he plays it. You yeah. know, what, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to do, do what he does. What you're describing here is another approach to transcribing, though. And sorry, I'm counter provoking you because I'm, I'm really interested in your point of view, but you said I'm tanging a lot because I play with electric guitar and bass guitar and I I want to, you know, have a similar sort of attack, like I'm picking uh, the, the reed on the saxophone. And that to me is exactly what you gain from transcribing. You hear a sound and you start practicing a way to replicate that sound. Replic- you know, sometimes yeah, so- uh, sometimes we hear things that are played by saxophone players and or other instruments. If I hear a guitar playing and is playing the same note in a different octave, I don't play guitar, but I can try to learn on the saxophone how to reproduce that sound. And as you said, you know, you wanted to have a similar attack to a picked guitar. So you you started working on your tonguing. And then uh, because you had a sound in mind, you hear a sound coming from a guitar. And the question is how I can replicate that sound. And you just so a perfect example to, to what I'm saying. So I did say at the end of the video that I think that uh, copying music, other musicians is great and you need to do that yeah. I think that you know it's great I, I all my students I always tell them um I like I give them a list of saxophone players which you know which I like like Jan Garborek and and uh Brecker and Sidney Bechet and all those people and that sound really different and you know I, I like all the musicians usually so it's like to me it's like Cannonball and Coltrane and and you know and Sonny State I really like and I like listen to them and then try to do your impression of them. So I think that's very important. So that's one thing I always tell people. That's one thing. Second thing is, I'll give you another example. So there is, um, I, which that's a funny example. Like there is, uh, I heard, I think it was Jimmy Rosenberg doing this. Jimmy Rosenberg was a gypsy jazz um, musician. He did this lick that he alternates between, he picks one string, open string, and then he um, alternates it with, uh, with, 
playing notes on the string above it, okay? And I did something, and I wanted to get that sound, generally speaking, and I used false fingering to do it to you on the saxophone. And and it's uh, it's not about the note he's playing. I just I like the thing that he's doing, and it's like I didn't transcribe it because it, it would make no sense technically. Because I'm trying to do something in like, let's say, one, two, three, four, take it, take it, yeah, take it. One, two, three, four. Like 30 second notes. I need something that sits perfectly on the saxophone to make it work. So I figured out a way. So transcribing him won't help me because it will just give me his lick and I would have to practice it. I was I wanted to find some way to kind of replicate the the you know the the effect it had. And it's so funny because my guitarist helped me do it. And he started finding a way to do it on guitar, even though I actually took it from a guitarist originally, yeah. right? And and then also once I found that, found that I was like, okay, now let me do it in six tablets. Find a way different way to do it in six tablets. And again, it's a physical motion that works for the saxophone. Or like I have a thing that I'm doing now, which again I'm giving I'm giving some of my secrets. But I have a thing that I'm doing now. Um, I did it on on uh, you hear me. We're gonna have a live thing coming, but I did it on Dirty Horse. I did it on uh, on some of the songs, and specifically, I did it on this out on on a song called CD Yiddish, Part One. And I'm doing. I figured out a way to do, basically, switch. Right, so I'm just playing triads and I'm switching, and I start. Should I go in really out into it? Because if you don't play saxophone, it's no longer gonna make sense to anybody. Should I should I say it or no? Yeah, yeah, you should can say it. Saxophone. You can okay, say it. Cool. So, all right. So let's say. You start around the middle G, right? So the lowest G, basically, you got on the saxophone. So middle G. So it can be G. It can be G sharp. Um, it can be F sharp even, but let's say G. And then you go up around C. So you go G, C, E, G, C. So you have one, two, three, four, five. And then you go down. Same thing. So you got and then you change to E. So you have... G sharp, B, E, G sharp, B. And when you can switch chords. Now, what I like about it, first of all, it sounds like sweeping. Everybody that haven't played was like, what, what, like, what the hell was that? It sounds like it, like Van Halen or the guitar is sweeping. Because it does have a sound that sticks out. I can do it in any key. I can just switch chords. It's super easy technically. It's just like the streak that I found, right? And once I found it, I was like, okay, now let me flip it around. Let me do four and then do 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 So it flips over. Let me do it in three. Let me do it in six. Let me do another note. Let me take another note out. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but I I think this is what you know. All all my guests are are saying in my podcast. So I I start to feel happy that we can agree on on a lot of things. And you know, you hear something and. I think we need to clarify, probably we have a different uh, definition for the word transcribe because you, you said in regard to the guitar thing that you are doing that um, it's not worth it transcribing it, but actually you did it, right? Because you heard the guitarist playing something and even if you didn't put it on paper, but you actually listen to several times and try to figure out what is that sound that you hear. So when I talk about transcribing, I'm not talking to physically, you know, take note by note. Well, there are some solos that I have never written down. I just memorized and, and played. Because I'm, and I'm telling all my students, you write it down only if you want to analyze it. But if you want to learn, you know, a new thing, just memorize it. And then you start doing what you described. You start changing things. You start changing approach. You, you try to make it uh, worth for you and fitting for you, for your, for your style. But you start from listening to something that catches your attention and say, oh, I want to do that. I want to use that. Isn't it? So, yeah, like I said, I always, and I did say that I, you know, that I transcribe 
specific stuff in the video. Do I always look for stuff that stands out? Yeah. Um, and have my ears open. But I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't unscribe his entire solo. Do you understand? Know yeah. And I wouldn't unscribe um, an entire Jimmy Rollenberg solo. It takes me forever, and it's just, it's not, it's just, it's, it doesn't have, like, the little bit that I want to take, it won't take me that much time, and I can get a ton out of it. But the, but most of it, you know, like, every vice, okay, that's true about everything in life. That's true about people, about, you know, everything. Every vice, sorry, every virtue is a vice at the end of it, right? So every, you know, if you, it's good to be frugal with money. It's good to be, to save money, but you can also be a cheap, and yeah. that's not good. Yeah. You know, you can be very nice to people, but you can also be a doormat at the end of it. Everything, every vice is a virtue uh, at the end of it and, and and vice versa. So it's the same thing with transcribing. It's like to me, if you have one good like thing that stands out in a solo, you know, it's it's good to do that. But you don't but you don't need to do um, 15 courses of giant steps for that one lick that you yeah. want to learn. Yeah. And, and people do that. And I think. Listen, I think people do, and it has to do with the leaks too. I think they do it for two reasons. First, we don't have to think. Well, I guess a lot of reasons. First, we don't have to think. We're like, okay, I'm transcribing. We have a big project, and we don't have to think about it. Um, second thing, which again, sometimes is good. Second thing, um, they get a lot of likes on it because when you play, when you play. Uh, bass and you play a Coltrane solo everybody's or even singing everybody's like super into you and you get all the likes and all the like oh that's crazy um and then another thing is that you and let us do also playing leaks it's like if you play something that Coltrane play you don't have to ask yourself if it was good or not you don't have to ask yourself was the idea good was it made did it make sense musically you're like oh Coltrane played it it's like I quoted Coltrane, and Coltrane is the best. So, you know, I feel safe <laughs> yeah. in my house. Uh, when I played. <laughs> and then, sorry, one more thing about it. I, I played with this guitar player here in Milwaukee, and he, he explained to me some stuff, because I, um, a lot of my friends are not uh, just saxophonists in the scene. They're just saxophonists, but they're not necessarily the people in the scene. So he explained to me that when he listens to solos, like they all transcribe the same solos, they all listen to the same people, and then they get the references, you know, and and like oh this is the B side that Kurt Rosenwinkel used uh, on like the, on Mark Turner's album, and it's like and I don't like Kurt Rosenwinkel, you know, you know I guys have met him and I legitimately don't like him, but it's okay he doesn't like me either, but it's I you know it's like, I don't play this game as my player and it's like a lot of people like I gave in videos example everybody transcribes uh, Samskank Funk in Barcelona and it's a great solo and it's actually a great I love the show it's like a killer show uh, Breaker Bottles in Barcelona it's, and it's really top notch and but everybody does it so when I've, when people play that lick to me when I hear people play it I was like ugh makes me feel kind of icky inside but for other people they're like oh I know that lick I also learned that lick I like it but uh yeah uh look i'm not against people transcribing whole solos or doing whole solos i mean everyone is free to do whatever they like if i decide to transcribe a whole solo is for for a pure musicologist point of view i want to have the whole you know creative arch in that track and understand possibly two uh, percent of what Illinois jacket was thinking during five choruses over a blues for example you know or the evolution I transcribed recently a whole solo by Chris Potter on all the things you are in a duet with shy maestro and the way they move you know, the form and the key centers. It's really interesting to me. And so it's good to see that in the sixth chorus, they they land doing something as a consequence of what they did in the fifth chorus. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to play like them. 
I, I don't want to go out and memorize the solo and then I go to a gig and I play uh, his solo. I'm not interested in that. But sometimes I get interested in the whole you know, unit of a creative process. Uh, but absolutely, if you want to take out one phrase or just one sound, one, one, one thing that you know, gets your attention. Uh, the problem that you are describing is that in today's uh, life, especially young people, students that approaches to jazz or new people uh, that approaches jazz, uh, they th uh, think like being at the supermarket. You know, that everything is there for you to take and, and use at no cost first and at no effort second. Now, you know that this is not true. And also, uh, the other part of of the beginners think that there is a sort of magic behind it. So if you are able to transcribe uh, some skunk funk in Barcelona, it means that you unlock, you know, a sort of Pandora vase and you get access to the magic of it. While, you know, you know better than me, I recently read uh, the uh, Brecher biography and he was practicing like 12 hours a day. That's the magic behind it, you know, and he was practicing his stuff. He was, of course, he was listening to a lot of people and he idolatrized a lot of people, but then he was making his own thing, you know, on the saxophone by practicing 10 hours every day, day and night, day and night, when he was living in the lofts in, uh, in New York in the 70s, they were playing all night and all day. You know? they were playing every day, exactly. Yeah. And so was playing every day. In the these time. days, uh, you know, we live in this world where someone is coming up on YouTube, giving out a video with a recipe, you know, the recipe to become better. Stop doing this or... <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. I know because... We, we all uh, do the same stuff, but I'm not particularly fan with people uh, that come up with videos like do this thing and you instantly, you know, improve. Yeah. That's a lie. And we can't, we can't scam people. We can't lie to people because, uh, you know, if you are good at what you are doing, it means that you have practiced a lot and you have invested an incredible amount of time, possibly in a wise way, because you can also waste a lot of time <laughs> when you practice, right? Yeah. And so all, the, and also the example you provided before of this guy that I have, I uh, haven't seen that is playing the sharp eleven on a on a sub uh, on a sus chord, uh, and everyone makes a case. That's a good clickbait. You know, but it's nothing else. And maybe the guy, I don't know, was thinking how to pay the mortgage and he just played the wrong note and he becomes a genius. You know, but this is unfortunately the world we are living that because everyone has access to a, an incredibly large amount of information, first of all, we don't check the sources. So we tend to believe that if you put a video on where you say, oh, you play the saxophone like this because it's better, you will have s someone who will try and will end up playing like this, right? Because, oh, I've, I've seen this guy, he's, he's cool, yeah. And, and he was playing and it was working. Oh, it was incredible. So we, we need to be aware of that and we need to have some you know, weapons to go against that idea that uh, music in particular, being not a science, requires a lot of uh, study, a lot of maturity also in yourself. But in jazz, that you defined at the beginning of the interview as a language, to me, is not that different from a small kid learning a language, what they do is transcribing their parents and then they try to use the same, you know, patterns, but in their own way. They are learning 
the nuances, the articulation, the dynamics. You know, if they get upset, they don't use a sweet tone in her voice or in their voice. They use a pretty loud and, you know, pretty sharp voice, right? If they get upset, because they are good transcribers, because they use the ears to understand what's behind the sound. I would say about that, and I'm, I'm not going to even sound as a attempt, I'm not going to call anybody out, but, and it's also it's not something new, but a lot of people don't, like most of the audience, don't know enough of jazz history or enough of jazz players. Yeah. Like, um, like Woody Wand Wandoff is, is, is a good, is not a jazz player, but it's a good example of a person that was really famous, nobody knows, Earl Bostick, um, is another good example. Yeah. And a lot of people just take something that somebody else did, and some people do it to Breaker now, which is funny, because uh, yeah. uh, Brentford Marsalis complained that Breaker did it to Ernie Watts and, uh, and, and, and Colton. But they take something that somebody did that's very out there and very like unique voice, and they just put it in a box. A lot of times it's just by, you know, putting in a different context. And, um, I, you know, and just... And but you know the audience don't know better, and the audience a lot of times is just jazz music, other jazz musicians, but they don't really dig the dig the deep. Like when I talk to jazz to jazz people in in schools when I teach clinics, I'm always surprised by how little jazz they actually know and how how little they actually listen to jazz. Yeah, young people don't listen to music in the way we were. They they don't retain anything. They don't know details. They don't know who's playing. They don't know what ear that recording has been made they they are not curious to know but uh, the the world has changed and i don't know i try to do my part but it's every day harder and harder to convince you know i i teach in two universities here in australia and sometimes i'm shocked you know i teach a saxophone student and they don't know i don't know sometimes they don't know dexter gordon and I think, man, you should ask yourself what are, what you are doing here. You know, not that is necessary, but I think if you enroll into a university and do a major in jazz and you play the saxophone, well, <laughs> you know, there are few things that it's a must. And, and if you ignore them, you live in, in a dream that all of a sudden can vanish. You know, like a soap bubble. It's even if they know a lot of times, it's like, yeah, I know, but like I he heard a few songs. Yeah. It's it, it's funny because you have all this uh, compact disc behind you, all the CDs. And yeah, it's so that when we were young, so to find a new CD to me in Israel was to find a new CD of Coltrane, but I didn't have like it was really, I was super into Coltrane, um, like the uh, quartet and the leather stuff. and yeah, when when I was growing up, I remember listening to I remember listening to a lot of stuff. But like um, I love Supreme, it completely blew my mind. And you know, and Robert Coleman, and showed all those people. And I was, uh, you know, you get a CD and you just listen to it all the time, like all the time. And you reading all everything. the line and notes, you know, all the details. Yeah. And I was also daydreaming, you know, looking at the dates. Oh, so. This was recorded on the 13th December of 1959, and I was thinking, what, you know, what was the weather that day? And Sonny Rollins, you know, going out from his apartment and heading off to the studio, and then maybe it was very cold, maybe he didn't like the read he was playing, you know, and trying to imagine that word. And then you start putting things in context, because the next CD... It's another player, but it has been recording like two months later. And you can start, oh, I can, now I understand, you know, some links. I, oh, I know from where this is coming from. So, uh, but un unfortunately, you know, people listen now to music on, on Spotify and you are lucky if you can get the name of the artists who are yeah. playing, you and know. That's uh, another thing, by the way. So, again, it's not necessarily a knock on transcriptions, but it does feel like a lot of 
and, and if you're a different generation, then it's also different, right? So it's yeah. like if you are age, it's a little bit different. But if you, I feel like for a lot of the younger guys, it's like we would listen to music and transcribe it, like, oh, I'm going to do this solo, and they do it with amazing slow down and write it down and learn how to play it. But they didn't listen to it without playing almost at all compared to like how much I would, without learning the solo, how much I listen to it when I grew up. You know, but I can, I can, like, a lot of CDs that I haven't heard in, like, in 10 years, I can, I still remember everything. And not because I learned them, because I spent so much time listening to it. And it's like, it, you can't, to me, you can't replace the, take yourself out as a listener. That's another thing that bothers me a lot. When people try to learn a song, like, when I try to learn a standard, so it's funny, because I said, not, but when I learn, I don't learn it from the real book, I, I learn it from the recordings, right? Yeah. So, you know, so it's like, I learn, when I learn a standard, I find some recordings that I like. Usually, I try to find something that's a little bit older, something with singers, uh, you know, again, people that I like, like Alfred Gerald or Louis Armstrong or Bill or whatever. And I looked for a few versions so I can, you know, learn how they did it. Um, but before I even touch the saxophone, I just listened to it a bunch, you know? And it's just, you, I, I, you have to have, you have to have some sort of, to me, of experience music before you put your shit on it sorry yeah. for this language before you put your stuff on it before you start playing with it before you start to be like okay i'm how, how am i how do i fit here in here you need to have some experience with it but you're just the listener you know and um and again and i know i understand that a lot of stuff i say you're saying okay but it it doesn't really saying you're not saying against transcription you're saying against other stuff. I'm like, yeah, it's true. You can do, you can transcribe and also do all the stuff that I'm saying. You can do that. Um, I just, like I said, I made the video because I feel like it's, it's not everybody needs to hear it, but some people need to hear it. Yeah. But also the, the thing that I don't like about doing videos that I say to don't do something, it's like, that, well, at least you do something. Most people do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, to me, that's the one thing that I was talking to. That's a good my point. My friend, give a guitarist, Danny. Yeah. The guitarist was like, yeah, I don't like how transcription became such a big thing, but I also don't like saying to not ascribe because to me, most people don't even do that. So it's like, it's hard for me to tell somebody don't do that. And then the people that actually do something are like, oh, why is he saying to not do that? What you I tried I mean? to say is do it in a profitable way. So there, there are ways you can make a lot out of it. But I, I don't think I would ever suggest don't do it at all. I would say do it and do it in a way that you can learn something. You see, if you just transcribe the notes and you put it on paper, that's, I don't know, that's words for a publisher, but not for you to, to become better. You know that my first, my first jazz teacher... Um, asked me to transcribe a Lester Young solo on a, I still remember it, uh, was on a blues called Easy Does It. And, and then I transcribe it. There were several mistakes in it. We fix all the notes. And then he let me spend like two months on learning Lester Young's vibrato. As he said, notes are 10% of what you can learn here. What you can learn are other things. And the reason why he wanted me to spend so much time on his vibrato is not because I need to use the Lester Young vibrato, but to understand that there is so much more musical content in that vibrato than in 200 notes. And to me, that was a good point. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you this. So I'm, I'm pretty new to making videos, and there, there is a reason why I, I didn't do it. I was, you know, it's like I'm not doing as much. I've done some personal stuff um, that happened in my life that, that prevented me from being on the road, and that's how I made my living until recently. Um, so, you know, so I'm making all these videos now, me and the guitarist for Marvin, but... I I bought the same ideas that I had 
when I taught clinics. So again, I used to teach a lot of clinics. I would play, um, at some point, I would, we would play over 200 shows a year. We'd just go and just play every day and then from town to town. And then a lot of times we would do clinics in the mornings uh, in colleges. And a lot of times I was, I was thinking, like, how much are we really getting? Like, and what can I really make the students get? Because I was like, I can explain to them how I think about rhythm. Uh, which is like Indian solfege, and I can explain to them I think about harmony, which I have, I have my system that I think is very good. But I don't, I thought, like, no matter how well I present my case, I don't think they would get it. So after a while, I was thinking, if I can get somebody to th- rethink about their choices and be aware to what they're doing, because they're doing stuff implicitly, you know, then I did a good job. Like, just because we get into the cyclical type of living. And um, there is the thing that, another thing that I always say, tell my students, if you want to get better, you have to want to get better. You do stuff all the time and you never get better at it. You make eggs in the morning, you tie your shoes, you, the way you are, a lot of people is the way of relationships, like the way you treat your parents, the way you treat your spouse, the way you you parent. It's like you don't think about, okay, how can I be a better spouse? You don't really sit and think about it. How can I be, can I be a better, um, you know, a better son? And if you take five minutes to think about a lot of times, you can make minor adjustments that will make a world of difference. So I just try to get people to read in my videos. Um, I tell them how I think, but it's more like I try... My goal is really not to get them to think the way I think, because I don't need a bunch of Danny clones running around. Um, and also, if you have Danny clones, that's not the way I think. If I if I would hear myself, I'd be like, I disagree with everything this guy said. <laughs> so I just want to have people try and think about their decisions and some and keep some of them and change some of them, and then maybe you know have new ideas about what to do to get better if they want to get better. That's really that's really my goal when I make those videos. It's not about like, I give you a recipe and if you follow it, you're gonna be a good musician. And if you don't follow it, you're gonna suck as a musician. You get you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more with that. Um, look, uh, <laughs> that was the first question, actually. Uh, but I think we can start to wrap it up. Uh, I need to ask you two questions, though, that are the uh, the last two questions. So one is, who was the most difficult player you have ever transcribed? And difficult can be in terms of, you know, getting the right sound or because it's, it's really complex or maybe because it was played on a bassoon and or on a recorder to go back to your video so I would say this so Jan Garbarek I could not understand how he gets his sound and because it was modern stuff relatively I you know you keep going to okay what kind of reverb he uses because he uses all these crazy reverbs and I was like what kind of um, mics he uses and I talked to his engineer and all that stuff and I was really getting into that and then when I went deeper into older guys like Sidney Bechet, it clicked. Because with the older guys, I was like, okay, there is nothing that in the recording. It's like it's just the way they play. Yeah. So the second I figured that out, I also figured Jan Galbraith out. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I, ha- I had this thing that I was like, oh, it's, it's probably because it's this or that, like all this technical stuff or gear stuff. And then just... So I couldn't get it until I started getting the older guys. And then I was like, okay, now I get it. Yeah. Because it made me look not outside of myself, look inside of myself and how I can change my ambassador, change the inside of my mouth, how I can change how I, you know, the valves that I use when I play. And um, and so that was to me, it, that was like a really big challenge that it took me a second to to be happy with and to get, to get you know, what I wanted. And again, once I got it, it's not like I... I play like him, but it's like I, I had I had it in my bag. Okay, now I can figure out what I what I think about myself, you know, and find my own my own tone. Sure. <laughs> this is me. Oh, how long ago was that? Oh, uh, I was probably eighteen, nineteen, 
and I was studying in a jazz school in Florence and he came to play in a venue and I was sent uh, by the school to open his concert with the small ensemble that I was involved with at that time as a student. And he came uh, to Florence to, to present the recording Star with uh, Jack DeJeanette and uh, Dave Holland, I think just trio. And he was so kind that I was I was playing this, the sound check for the student band and they arrived at the venue. And when I finished, Jan was, you know, there uh, down the stage and he introduced himself like if I didn't know who he was. <laughs> And he said, uh, look, I don't have time now, but if you're happy, uh, after dinner, before the concert, we can warm up together in the dressing room. And to me, it was like, you know, heaven. Yes, I'm, I was a big fan of, of his music and starting from the Kit Jarrett European Quartet and all his, his bands and, and projects. And... So and I was thrilled because I I thought now I get the secret of his sound now I can understand and you know you know what reeds he was using at that time so he he's he was playing a bear glass in metal mouthpiece yeah and the reeds you know that we always look for a good reed a rico not even royal just the Rico. Oh, cheap ones. <laughs> number two. You know, can I say something about that? Yeah. For saxophone players? Yeah. To me, that's the biggest misconception about saxophone for saxophonists is that they think that the thicker the read, the thicker the sound is. And it's not that it's not true. The thicker the read is, it's like you you have to blow a little bit harder and it makes um more high mids. And actually if you look at a lot of those people like Young Garbo, I can I I play on soprano. I play um, Hemke number two. Yeah, it's like you you want to play with soft reed, and no, and it's also I use every reed in the pack because of that. So I try to use basically as light as I can afford, because lighter than that, I'll just start squeaking or oh. out of tune, right? We can have another interview but, on on saxophone yeah. reeds because even even there, <laughs> I tend not to suggest anything at all if a student asks me what read should i play i i say the read that makes you feel natural so it depends also of course on the mouthpiece but this is not a saxophone <laughs> technique <laughs> podcast but Did anyway them... sorry right, sorry i'm saying a lot of students i like that come to me they play and it's like the air is coming out and it's, like, yeah. it's so hard for them i was like dude you can barely make a sound like, yeah chill it out but you know, if a student comes and plays wonderfully and plays a three and a half, why should I change it? I say, you sound great. If it, play, if it sound good, yeah, of you course. You sound great. Course, no. What do you want from me, <laughs> right? But, yeah, no, but no, that, no magic number. But that day with young Garbeck was, was a big revelation. And in fact, you know, I understood one for all that, you know, it doesn't matter the sound again is something that you have in your head you can imagine but if you don't have the right features you can dream of having a young garbage sound but you will end up sounding as yourself all the time and that's good that's a good thing right because we can try to be in the like of but we never uh, will be someone else and yeah. that's good and the last question will be which transcription you have done before you stop transcribing <laughs> uh, that is still your favorite or which mm. you know phrase or which which was your favorite that you remember fondly well it's like I did a lot of solos that I really liked you know it's like I even I came back and did, um, that's another point actually, but I did Bird of Paradise, which I, you know, a lot of people did. Yeah. So just, I love it solo. 
and I love Charlie Parker. It's like, I just like I love all, all the older saxophone players. It's so funny to me because I heard this, uh, your interview with Pianist and it's like I and a lot of the stuff written on Skype, right on Skype. Yeah. <laughs> Peace and all stuff. I was like, yeah, it's great. And you you hear it and you're like, what, what's going on here? Like, Ornette Coleman is very interesting with on Skype. I don't Skype a lot of that album. Yeah. Actually. You see, that's, that's something that was interesting because he thinks in a different way because he does stuff that, that, you know, because it's free jazz. I remember one of the people that I heard for the first time, I was like, wow, what is that? And that's actually, the notes are interesting because the way it's very not obvious yeah. is choices. Yeah. So, you know, I, I discovered a lot of that album. Um, and you make me thinking that, um, sadly, recently, Wayne Shorter passed away. And did you notice how, uh, how few books are out there with Wayne Shorter transcriptions? And this is this is funny, you know, because you can find heaps of books on Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and Dexter, Joe Henderson and everyone. But when it comes to Wayne Shorter, that, you know, is one of the big names. Uh, yeah. You you don't find transcriptions. And this is for me very interesting because he was uh, beyond theory beyond patterns beyond playing you know just mathematically stuff that makes sense on the paper you know he was just creation and creativity in a pure state and it's very hard to transcribe because sometimes even the rhythm that Wayne Shorter uses is absurd and and it's almost non-writable with the tools that we have available today. You know, you think, you know with Wayne Shorter, it's, again, somebody that listened to a million hours of Wayne Shorter, um, actually, yeah. When 9 11, you know, everybody remember when 9-11 happened, I was listening in Israel, I was listening to Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock, the One Plus One album. Yeah. Um, but... Um, it's, I think, and, okay, so it's, I'm not a big fan of how Breaker played jazz. Honestly, I love Breaker Bottle. I'm not a big fan of how Breaker played jazz. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into it, but I have my reasons. But I think that some of the reasons that Fusion never caught, I think there are a couple of reasons why Fusion never caught, and I'm uh, yeah, playing Fusion, is that the writing, like the songs never caught, you know, it's like the most famous fusion songs are Herbie Hancock songs that are like barely fusion. It's more like jam, like it's really simple. Um, so it's like some of the most important jazz musicians, it's not even about how they play. It's how the music they wrote and how they figured out how to play on it. And to me, Wayne Shorter is one of those people. He's like, he's so influential. And it's the reason is because he completely defined a lot of style of jazz. And he did, he did it in a way that to me, again, I'm sure a lot of people will not like it, but to me, I don't like where people took it after him. Like, he took it to a way, like, before that, it was a lot of fun, before him, a lot of functional harmony, and with him, it's like all the modes of melodic man, all of the sardines and all the stuff at least. Often, it, it's like good voice, it's like voice leading, not really like um, function. Yeah. And it's like he it completely created the sound in jazz, and it's just it's a great sound. And yeah, I, I, I you know I'm not a big fan of where it went from there, but it's like I love how he did it. And then it's like you can't even quantify his, his effect as a player. I think because of it, do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I always found interesting to see that you know not many people transcribe when shorter, and there are only a bunch of very you know, a short list of solos of him. And because his playing is, is beyond all the theory and beyond the... He has so much great music, though. Yeah, in he, different he's styles. like a... Like even like Native Dance or such a great album. Yeah. You know, it's like some, like, it'll be funny, not him, like, but like uh, when it's just a uh, fusion, but like, uh, the album is great, Native Dance. Yeah, and, but uh, I mean, yeah. th there is... Uh, the Johnny Mitchell Travelogue, the double album with the orchestra and Vince Mendoza. Yeah. And Wayne's solos are like, I don't know, probably he wouldn't pass an audition to a university 
if you consider the theory behind it. You say, yeah. dude, you are playing C major arpeggio or F major arpeggio all the time. What are you doing? But then you stop thinking at the theory, just listen, and it's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. So that that's unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Danny, I won't profit any more of your time. You've been so kind and thanks for accepting my invitation. And sure, thank you for having me. I, I'm pretty sure that our uh, listeners will appreciate the debate and will uh, learn something from what we discussed today. So I wish you the best of luck with all your endeavors and experiments in music. Thanks for being part of uh, this podcast. Thanks a lot. Again, and just let me just flag the Marvin thing. So everything I do is part of Marvin. Yes. M A R B, like boy I N, Marvin, like yes. Marvin for B. So our latest album is Dirty Horse. Uh, the other stuff I sent you is the Gypsy Jazz. It's called Fernway. Um, I have another thing. I just didn't want to sing too much, but I have another album that I did during COVID, which is a little bit different style with Antonio Sanchez on drums yeah. called um, Russian Dolls, which is. Kind of right. I don't know. Anyway, I mean, all, all the links that you want uh, to be on the video and on the podcast will be in the description. So you can send me an email and I will include everything. I've listened to the uh, to the album you sent and it's pretty good stuff. So guys, check Marvin out. It's a band that uh, goes from some, I would say, punk jazz style into a gypsy or a musette, French musette, or a like a, a Django Reinhardt style in a, in a skip of a track. So I really love that because he, if you listen to some of my albums, I always loved uh, built my albums like you know sketches and or rooms, and every room has a different color on the walls and different uh, furnitures in it. But I really uh, love the concept behind the sound of the band. So check the band out. And of course, please subscribe to both Marvin YouTube channel and Mirko Guirini YouTube channel. Don't forget to do it because we like to feel supported and loved. And see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, man.